You're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Mission Log Prodigy, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. Supplemental. Star Trek Prodigy creators, Dan and Kevin Hageman. Welcome everyone to a very special edition of Star Trek Prodigy, the podcast here on Roddenberry Podcast Networks. Uh, I'm going to jump right into it because as you can see on the YouTube video, which we we uh, produce and we release exclusively with the audio version of it, we have uh, Dan and Kevin Hageman, the mm. creators of Star Trek Prodigy. And as much as I would love to pat out uh, my uh, appreciation and my love for their work, I think that you've already heard what I have to say about Prodigy from the last five videos that we did, uh, that Ashley and I did. And I'm so sorry, Ashley, that you couldn't be here with us. You're here with us in spirit. My sister, mm -hmm. I love you. You know that. Um, but let's just jump right in. Uh, welcome, Dan, and welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for being on the show. Do you mind if I jump just right in? With Get the into it, Norman. We are so happy <laughs> let's to go. be here. So let's go. I've got in. my swimsuit on. I am ready to dive. Let's All go. righty. Um, this may be a little bit of a, uh, of a pointed question, you know, at, at the start, uh, but because, uh, we're coming up on the new release of the next five episodes, you know, on Paramount plus, and we're just coming off of, uh, the release, uh, for the first five episodes on Nickelodeon, was it ever a concern for the both of you to have, uh, this branded Star Trek show, um, with Nickelodeon involved and have that influence your your audience base with a, oh, this is just a young audience show. Oh, this is maybe just a kid show. It, uh, in, in, um, instead of having it uh, appeal to the, the broader Star Trek audience. Has there been any feedback uh, from the audience at large about that? Were, were you surprised or was this kind of on par with what you expected? I mean, I think I, the feedback that we've been seeing, we've been ecstatic about. Um, in terms of like, I think we were worried about too, when we were first approached, we didn't want to make it too young of a show, you know? Uh, but in our line of work, it's like when we look at, I mean, I think a lot of people can look at animation going, oh, that's for a younger audience. We look at animation, you look at like a, a movie like Finding Nemo and I go, that's a classic for any age. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when we, we, we always tend to look at animation as an opportunity to buck trends to buck what people's expectations are and uh we if anything we've been enamored and so thankful that the trek audience has has embraced the show as as well as a young audience i think we we've been able to find that place where it hits both sides i think also it has been fun you know before the show aired to see a lot of trek fans going, oh, it's going to be a Nickelodeon show. It's going to be for super young, you know, audience. And then they started to see the trailer. They started to see our opening um, main title sequence with like Giacchino's music and the visuals. And so I'm like, it's so gorgeous. Yeah, they're, they're like, <laughs> oh, like everyone's kind of like, oh, I've got my eye now open and I'm listening, you know. And then finally to start to see our episodes come out. And to see that, you know, we don't hold back any punches, you know, and that we really are trying to go for a show that's for everyone. I think we were, we were discussing this off air a little bit, but too, it's like we're, it's, it's nice to see what people are th like, that evolution of thought of even when people were watching the pilot and going, oh, this looks too much like Star Wars. We expected that. We knew that. We knew, and we knew we wanted to start from a place that was outside Federation space that didn't feel like Star Trek. But we were always going to get there. We wanted to make sure that this was not just a show for uh, Trek nostalgia, but a show for a brand new audience to introduce them to this Trek verse. You know, at the right pace. Instead of saying, "Hey, here are 200 shows, and you know, five or six or seven or eight different series. Where does where do you start?" We wanted to have a place where you're start you're starting from the very beginning. You know, from characters who don't know anything about Star Trek, and we're and we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a fair thing to say, and and I I wanted to bring in the audience to a little bit of that behind the scenes that we were talking about. Uh, it's it's almost um unfair uh, in in ter terms of the the popular critical uh, first blush of of, of any science fiction uh, property where there are robots, lasers, 
uh, a wonderfully sweeping score and then package that all of, oh, it has to be Star Wars-ish. I don't know where that comes from without seeing the character development actually happening. And that happened beautifully in five episodes so far. And we still have 15 episodes to go. Uh, and, and I want the, the both of you to have a chance to be able to talk about why this particular show? Why Prodigy? And uh, this is a two-part question. Why now? And do you believe that in some way, shape, or form, there was a space that needed to be occupied for a less darker, less cynical version of Star Trek, where there's just far more optimism involved at the very end of the episode? Well, I mean... For me, that's uh, for me. Star Trek is optimism. You know um, that that's I. I'm a huge fan of the original series, and it had that optimism, but it also had huge adventure and big stakes and thrilling concepts and science fiction. All you know, and so that's I'm hoping people are sensing and seeing that DNA in our series. I think it started. To, I mean, Alex Kurtzman. What felt like there was a open space, so to speak, you know, like, where's the entry point? Um, you know, you go to a toy store and you see all these Star Wars toys, like, why aren't kids getting into Star Trek? And um, and so I think when we were kind of given that task, that awesome, amazing task, yeah, you look at, you, you have to boil down, like, how do you, what is Star Trek to a new audience? What do we, what do we want to share about Star Trek? And back to what my brother said, yeah, that optimism, that Gene Roddenberry, um, uh, the, the inclusion, the, you know, the, it was always, once we were like, that's what we want to share, it was very easy to see what the story would, would become, which is essentially what you're watching right now. You know, um, to, to represent one of uh, Ashley's, I think, best observations about Prodigy, she said that one of the reasons why she loves it, one of the reasons why I love it, and I think so many fans do, is that there is the, what they call the, the Matt Grenig approach to the silhouettes of the characters where every single character has a very specific, very immediately identifiable shape uh, that shows off the diversity and sometimes uh, subverts expectations, especially in Rock Talk's sense. Uh, it, it, until Rock Talk's, um, it, until she started speaking, we didn't know who or what Rock Talk was. So was this something at the very beginning that you were both very cognizant about being able to show all different types of not just body styles, but uh, gender representations, as we see in the fluidity with zero. And how do you how do you take the responsibility of getting that across without being, I guess, too, I hate to use the word, but I guess this is the best way to describe it, too woke about approaching a character like that? Well, can I say, Dan, let me start off because I think there's a lot of stages of development when you start to create a show and start to look at your characters. And at, at the very beginning onset, you know, we knew this wasn't a show about one hero. It was about a crew of characters. And when you create a crew, you want to really create dynamic relationships, right? Um, you know, again, going back to TOS, I love Bones and Scotty and Spock and, and Kirk and, and O'Hara. And you start to create a really great group, a crew, right? And they all sort of can play off of each other or complement each other in certain ways. And so that at a very beginning, Dan and I were like, how do let's make sure I want people to fall in love with the crew. Like, I don't want people to go, Oh, I love Dow. And that's, and then eh, you got rock talk. You got this other character, this Medusa. And I'm like, no, we want it. I want everyone to fall in love with the entire, all the crew members and why they work together as a family. Go ahead. And, and we come from a place too, where like, this, this is going to sound like, like corporate selling out, like, Oh, you want toys. But I'm like, well, I want toys. You know, when I, when I want we're toys, I'll be show, honest. I want theme park <laughs> yeah. rides. I want to ride in a theme park ride. I want to do these things. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was an early discussion of, of you're walking down the toy aisle. What are these characters going to look like? Why, are, why is each one going to be different? So in terms of like that woke question, it's like, well, you, you, we never really talked about that. It was always about, we want to have as diverse a crew as possible because these are going to, all going to be aliens. So let's, how, how, how different can we make them? I mean, I remember there was a zero iteration where zero had looked a little too much like C3PO and Alex Kirsten is like, how do we push zero? How do we make zero something even more different? Cause he's not, yeah. Or not, uh, or zero is not. not a, they, they are not a robot, right? Right. They are in a containment suit. So, and then going back to what Dan was saying, so after coming up with great characters that not only can 
play off each other really well, but also start off being the world's worst engineer, the world's worst captain, the world's worst, you know, medical officer or navigator, right? But to, to what Dan was saying, we love toys. And so when you think about it, you know, hopefully one day we will have toys and like zero, we're like, oh, it'll be an action figure that can light up, you know, Gwen, uh, a character like, you know, we, we know the history of like Star Wars action figures and how the female characters were sitting on the shelves, you know, and like, it's terrible. And so we're like, how do we give her the coolest weapon? Right. No, I remember, like, what we think glow in the dark, out, though, we it. wanted her skin to be like translucent, which is a little bit in there, but we're like, it's like a translucent toy, you know, like translucent skin. Rock yeah. talk is the big, the, the, uh, the muscle, you know, like the hugging action, you know, with rock talk. Jankum uh, can have all the tools and the grappling hook. You know, we always love the action figures with the grappling hooks. I always, that was like the first GI Joe I would ever buy. Kung that Fu came with a grappling. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so honestly, so toys also uh, that inner child in, in us, you know, mm-hmm. of wanting to buy those. Even toys. the photo star itself, the idea of movable parts. When we looked at it when we were children, you know, the Enterprise was a great toy, but it didn't have that toyetic, you know, we worked with Lego quite a bit, these words like toyetic, you know, we wanted to make sure that there was movable pieces, you know, things, it, it would it would look like one thing and then it would do something else. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that, it, it, we were doing it purely from a selfish place in which we want to own these toys. And so we want to help create these, this, this story, you know. Well, I mean, think um, if if I may be so bold as to as to assume that we're all of a, a very similar age group. I mean, there was a point in time in the late '70s and early '80s where a lot of that uh, that drove our imagination. And and sometimes, since we didn't have the articulation of the toys that we have today, our imagination had to lean a little bit more into that. And I think that's where I, I wanted to ask the both of you: like, it, where did this come from? Where did your ideas and your inspiration for Prodigy, I mean, aside from the toys, like the, the souls and the essences of the characters, how do you find their voices at the very beginning? I mean, Kevin had touched upon it a little bit. Like we knew what, we, we, we always felt, we looked at like, how do you get a younger audience into Star Trek? I know there's going to be some people who are going to argue with us that like you can easily get into the original series and things like that as, a, as younger, but it's like, we always felt like it was a, um, a barrier to entry was it's hard to relate uh, a younger person. It's hard to relate to someone on the bridge when they know everything. It's like, how do you, cause I, I feel like I, myself as a child, as a kid, and even now I don't know everything. I don't feel confident in that sense. I don't think I could walk on Jean-Luc's bridge. And yeah. Like well, let, me, let, let me just chime in here too, Dan, like look at TNG. I love TNG, but to sit down an eight year old and watch the beginning episodes of TNG in the second episode, they lose their, libidos right or the libidos go crazy right and it's sort of like make it now this is yeah you know yeah <laughs> you it, just you know, introduced us to these characters and now all of a sudden they're different people it's hard I'll, to I'll some, yeah i'll sometimes hear that argument of you know people who are diehard uh tng fans going you know the kids can get into tng i'm like yes they can but you can't i don't know i think those first few episodes don't pull a child in mm-hmm. as well uh, yeah so, so going from that place we wanted to, we like this idea of Let's let's see the origins of like what a great crew looks like, you know, starting from unmolded clay, you know, and and Janeway and Starfleet will get them to that place. So, you know, right now, you you know, if people are on episode five, they're at the very, very beginning of this journey. And we imagine, you know, I don't know where this journey is going to go all the way, but we, we wanted to draw it out. Uh, you made mention of of Janeway, and it's it's a nice segue into probably one of the bigger questions that a lot of fans have. Now, uh, it was nice to see you know the the intrepid style design of the Voyager coming to play with the Proto Star, albeit now we know the scale and it's not as big as you know that ship. But uh, I was talking about this with Nami in our interview uh, that was uh, released a few weeks ago. The the bars, the very specific Voyager esque bars, when Rock Talk pushed the Delta and it like you know ignited the ship. There's obviously a very specific through line with Janeway, that music, the intrepid style ship of that Voyager era. Why this era in particular? And we all know that Robert Beltran spoiled a little bit about, you know, what he's going to be uh, participating oh, in. Oh, oh, Robert. <laughs> now, if you don't want to talk about that, that's fine. That was, that was, that was his reveal and, and he'll own that. But with, why this era? I mean, uh, you know, there's, 
there's so much of Star Trek going back to the original series era, you know, with Discovery and now with Strange New Worlds or moving forward with Picard or moving even for the fur, you know, the furthest ever in 900 years with Discovery. Why the post Voyager era? And what well, people, because, because people want to move forward, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I want to move forward in Star Trek and I, and I hear that from other people as well. What's next? Like we, we, we keep going away from that what's next chapter. Well, and so- well, also we knew we wanted Janeway as the hologram. So it's like, that was something that we knew. So we're like, okay, well that puts us definitely after 2379. Um, mm-hmm. And then we were looking at certain things and, and we started um, figuring and out knew- what's going Pick on with Picard. Picard. Right, we yeah. Want, we're- we didn't want to hit in that area. Yeah, cause they were in production a little bit ahead of us. And so, um, yeah, we wanted to make sure we worked, you know, alongside them. Um, but yeah, it, it's new t- in the next chapter, it's new territory. We wanted to have fresh space, you know, to explore. So and that, that was one thing of mine. And as I, I mean, I love next generation, uh, on mission log, we're just finishing up Deep space nine, my first viewing of it. And I, I still have some of Voyager to get to, but there always has been kind of like this one question, like why not start from where Janeway ended in end game, you know, moving forward. Uh, do you feel like because uh, we're going back to the Delta Quadrant, do you feel like this, there is just so much more unknown exploration that allows us to see like these new vast galaxies and nebulas? Maybe we'll find coffee in there. Maybe we won't. By the way, mm-hmm. Janeway having hologram coffee is so meta. It's unbelievable. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's a must. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so is that why the, the choice into the Delta Quadrant? Because it's just the most unexplored and you have the most potential? I, we can't... <laughs> It's so, it's so, I know it's so hard because you guys haven't watched six yet, but no. yeah, we can, we can't, and we can't spoil any, we can't no, spoil but, anything. But but. We can't say, yeah, we wanted to, yeah, we wanted to have some freedom to be in, to at least start in a place where not everyone can, can say like, yeah, if we started in the alpha quadrant, I mean, it's not much of a journey for characters who right. don't know what. Yeah. What, pe- people people are going to. Characters. Yeah. We, we, they, we they would know Federation. Where th- these characters know nothing about Starfleet, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. nothing about the Federation. So that was, you know, we, we talked we, early on, we were with David Mack and yeah, yeah. We all kind of said, yeah, it should be the Delta Quadrant. I mean, we talked about the gamma, we talked about uh, quadrants, but like when you really look at it, you're like, it should be the Delta. Okay. Mm-hmm. How much, um, because, you know, we're in this universe now and, and because there's a certain amount of flexibility that you have with the unknown, which is fantastic. I think we're all looking forward to that. Uh, how much of the word canonical, like guides your, you know, your narrative choices, or is it something that you, you use sparingly so that you can maintain that just the, the overall flexibility of your storytelling? Cause I know canonical can be used can be weaponized in fan in in fandom some you know times or another mostly most of the time so uh how do you how I do think, you avoid those pitfalls i i, I mean dan you tell me but i, I think we're 100 percent canonical you know we're always thinking about that and we're making sure we fit in the greater universe and with um the backs with the history of characters and there's always species we meet. There's always places where you can try to come up with a little rule to make something a little bit different or to make something fit. Uh, but yeah, I think we do everything we can to fit canon. Uh, but I think we're always starting from a storyteller place first. Um, what's entertaining? What's yeah? We don't let that hold us back. We're not but, letting canon you know, dictate. But there's all. Where. But but let's Dan. I mean, there are examples of story ideas or you know things we wanted to do and after some much discussion, we're like, oh, we are breaking this one canonical idea. We should not, let's not, we're not going to do that. Yeah. We try to find a workaround on it, but yeah. If, if there's a workaround, we're like, okay, that, yeah, we buy that. Sometimes there's canon things where people will say, well, this is like David Mack is like, well, this is going on right in this area right here during this time. And we'll be like, that's amazing. We should tie that into this character or we should figure out a way to, to hit that more. Um, it's so, a, we, we come upon problem tunities, <laughs> you know, things that uh, at first are a problem, but hey, something golden comes out of it. I like that. Is that trademarked? Should I put that on the t-shirt? Aaron Wal- <laughs> I think we did that in the, the <laughs> Troll Hunters room. Aaron Walkie likes it quite a bit. I believe it. Where did that come from, though, Dan? Do you remember problem tunity? It's a great word. That is a great <laughs> yeah, word. Thing. Could be and since for writers, we're allowed to make up words, right? Can't we just <laughs> oh, sure. use a word and say it's real? That's, that's the process. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 
Now, I know I've asked you like a lot of nuts and bolts, and I, I kind of like want to switch the tone because I know that you're creators and you have certain passions and, and, and certain ideas that you wanted to, to get through, you know, into your you know, final product. One thing that I think that, at least for me, I've found the most beautiful in Prodigy is the attention to detail on characters' eyes. Uh, there are so many close-ups of Gwen reflecting the stars in her eyes when she and Dal were talking about that one very specific moment, looking at the stars. Or Rock Talk, when you're, when you're focusing on her, her eyes, the blue, the bright blue of her eyes in that reddish, brickish you know, structure of her face, you know, it shows off so much emotion. Zero itself is a giant eyeball. So there is that old adage of the eyes are the windows to the soul. Is that something that was specifically or consciously decided upon or is this a little bit more serendipitous no i think it's i mean we, we'll talk with ben quite a bit and ben agrees ben ben's on the same page where it's like just to sit on a character and see a character breathe makes them feel alive and i think the closer you get to the characters i feel like you know oftentimes when you when you get board artists in animation their first instinct is to create massive action anime action or something in which Movement, constant movement. Yeah, because that's constant exciting. Movement, the faster, the better. And in our point, it's like the, the slower and more real, you know, to see Indiana Jones jump and fail and to be hanging on and to see that fear in their eyes, you know, that to me connects me to a character uh, mm -hmm. much more so, than high action. I mean, I credit a lot to Ben Ebon, who's a fantastic director and he knows to do stuff like that. Um, but also that was always a very big mandate for Dan and I right up front. Like even though this is, you know, we're bringing in a lot of artists and people who'd worked on Teenage Mutant Ninja, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and all these other shows, action shows. And we're like, this show's gonna be different. Like we want the tone to be slowed down. We want it to feel, we kept saying cinematic, you know? And that means like we come, we're from the school of the thought of like the Spielbergian Amblin type of storytelling, you know, where it's very grounded. You gotta believe in the kid you know, an Elliot before he meets ET. Mm -hmm. So we want, you know, even though these are alien teenagers, how do we ground these kids? So you connect with them and feel them before they find the ship and all the adventures take place. Now with, um, with the amount of, of children that are watching that's, and, and you both know, that's a very specific focus, like on our podcast, having the kids call in and uh, asking him those questions. Mm -hmm. And I credit Rod, all the credit in the world. He, he wanted to find something that would connect uh, the podcast, you know, to the younger audience. Some of the answers that they come up with are just phenomenal. They're, 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 they're mind blowing. And, and that begs the question, how do you, how do you approach being able to write such really strong moralistic tales that can be so easily identified by children of a certain age. We're talking six, seven, eight, but also at the same time though, maybe it's just, you know, part and parcel with watching it with their parents, but parents also reminded that yes, Star Trek is a very moral tale, even amidst all of this beauty and glamor and wonder and pew pew, but at the very end of it, teamwork, you know, um, not thinking that, you know, everything, uh, finding that found family, is that something that was very important to you when you were writing these scripts? Yeah, I think early on when we were writing like what this show would look like, you know, we knew that Star Trek goes into some great places. Uh, but they were like, you know, but imagine if you're eight years old, what are the big questions for you? What are the things that you're trying to figure out? You know, and, and, and some, of the, some of those lessons are the tried and true one, things like failure, like how to push through failure and how to get to a better place through that. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was a joy. It was an honor and joy to be able to take these big concepts and to boil them down to something that a younger audience would, would, would be fascinated by or, or they would want, they would seek, because they're sponges. They want that stuff. And I think that to, to us too, it's like when we write these episodes, I, those are the things that give the, the framework and the structure to the episodes. Like, what do we learn? What do, what do we want to get to? And I love, I'm mean, working with Kate Mulgrew. She's like, she, you know, she, like she was like, adults need to learn these things all the time too. Like adults never stop learning. And I love hearing that stuff. You know, it, I think that's, it's, it's a great show to have that, um, to funnel those, those, those lessons in. And also like those lessons from the very beginning, you know, it's in the DNA of how Dan and I write, but it's finding it's, and it's finding the chemistry and the balance of, of yes, this is going to be science fiction, Star Trek, right? 
It's got to be also equal parts. There's got to be some humor and stuff in there. We want the show to be fun and we want it to be humorous at times, not a comedy, you know, lower decks has that, you know, but then, we, but for kids and for, I think some of my, my personal favorite entertainment, you know, it's, it's, there's humor always involved. And then most importantly, heart is always what Dan and I are always guided by first and foremost. If anyone says, Oh, we need comedy. It's gotta be comedy. I go, no, we need more heart. That's the problem with the episode. You know, the comedy and the adventure is the icing to the cake, you know? Now, if I, if I may uh, bring up a point, uh, Dan, you and I were talking about this, about the numbers, you know, that uh, may or may not influence the way that you decide upon like, you know, crafting the show. Being able to to do it, um, I wouldn't say in a vacuum, but being isolated enough to create this show, the 20 episodes that you're going to be producing, is that something 40, that- 40, don't, don't forget, season two. 40. Well, season two, yeah. I didn't want to jump ahead, you know, but for All just right. season one, um, season one's obviously going to have a very specific narrative arc going from episodes one to five and then the next 15 with, are they all- you know, I'm going to sidetrack my own question. Are they all going to be broken up into five episode chunks? Are these mini arcs? How does that decision made? No, I mean, I would say 10, I would say we always look at 10 episodes. Um, but even within 10 episodes, there's always a midpoint in the story. There's a strong midpoint. So you could say your episode five, your episodes 15 are going to be strong midpoints to the story. Mm-hmm. But not yeah, saying that we're not, you're not saying, we're not saying that we're going to have a break at every midpoint. Okay. No, 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 no. You're not going to be a break after every five episodes. I think this is this is just you know some of the beginning of a show trying to figure out how to make everything as good as great as it can be. Uh, but in terms of um, ten or twelve, you know, there, there's always midpoints of stories, and even then there's midpoints to midpoints of stories. So there's five, ten, twenty, forty. There's grand stories to tell. That I mean, we're always looking at. We're always we're mathematical in terms of breaking down story. I would say that. So I guess, um, how, how do you find uh, the best way, unless it's social media taking care of itself and policing its own kind of like momentum, how do you find uh, being able to keep, say, an audience engaged with these longer breaks? Because I know that, um, you know, that, that Prodigy is going to be on Nickelodeon for its five episode, right? And then it's going to come back to the second five episodes starting January 6th. But I do believe that there is a little bit of concern, especially out there in the social media space of how do we keep this momentum going even as fans and even as somebody who runs a podcast specifically designed to engage the audience how do we keep that content fresh and engage the fans overall is that a point of concern with you at least at this point with these breaks well, yeah i, I to, hopefully you're we let us we'll bring this up and we can strike it from the conversation if we really need to but dan i think it's okay to share like the reason why we had a break it's because of covid it's because of like trying to do a production during a pandemic. It's really, really hard. And every aspect of production is slowed down. And so we had a target and we tried to have all 10 episodes ready in time, but we didn't, yeah. we just couldn't. And, and everyone, our team is like killing themselves and we're trying to do our very, very best. And honestly, and, and so, it, and it, you see it around on other productions, other shows sure. are doing this too, right? And it, it, it is, it's a little, it's hard, and it's a little well, also, frustrating to hear yeah, fans well, say, oh, why would you do this? But I'm like, this is not a creative decision, folks. We're just, <laughs> we're trying to make entertainment in a yeah, pandemic. We, we, we don't <laughs> want to, it's like, if, if the choice is to lower our standards and have something subpar go out and hit the target, it's like, to us, it's like, we'd much rather have it look as great as it can be and have it stand the test of time, you know, instead of giving out something that's subpar. But, but let me add, of- but let me also add, Am I worried? Yes, uh, I'm a little worried just for people right now, but I'm not worried because when those next five come out, it's going to yeah. blow your minds. <laughs> People's hearts are going to be stirred. By the end of these 20 episodes, I, I, we've, we're going to have you. No, I we're, think you know, I've <laughs> no, yeah. You had me at one. I'm pretty sure you had a lot of people exactly. after Lost and Found. <laughs> no, but, but we knew five was a great place. We knew five was a great place. If we were going to have a little bit of a break, five was a great place. Ten's a great place. Yeah. Twenty's a great place. But the goal, yeah, the, the goal is not going to be giving you guys five episodes at a time. The episode, the goal will be giving you guys ten episodes at a ten. time. But Dan, are you okay that we that I announced that? Yeah, I think officially? that's all fine. I it's think that's you fine. know, I, I yeah, I don't like dancing around it. I don't like people thinking it's some sort of a 
bizarro creative decision that we had. No, no, I think that's a fair and honest answer. And I think that, um, you know, when this comes out, it'll assuage a lot of people's concerns about how it's going to be moving forward because we're still in the pandemic. We still have new variants coming out that still may even affect the process. So at least there's going to be an audience understanding out there and a level of uh, forgiveness saying that, you Mm -hmm. know what, these are hardworking people. These are human beings. They have to work. They have to risk themselves going to work, you know, or or not. Mm -hmm. And this is how it's going to affect the way things move forward. This is the new world that we live in. Um, and, but I'm, I'm glad that that Star Trek prodigy and, and its mission is softening the blow to give us great entertainment, to give us characters that we love, that we root for. And I, I guess that, um, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know that you're both are very busy, but I have to do a little bit of a lightning round with you just to get kind of like your own <laughs> personal pulse on, on the uh, this will be the easiest way to get myself and my brother to say things that we're not supposed to say. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what a lightning round is. <laughs> so let's well, see what we can pull out of you. Okay. How about a static bubble round so we can get a little <laughs> okay. bit so it's not so it's reactionary? So, yeah. <laughs> for the both of you, who is your favorite prodigy character and why? <sighs> That's always like you can't. We, 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 this is a tough one. I mean. <laughs> Gwen, Gwen is fantastic. I love Gwen. Gwen, I love Gwen. Yeah. yeah, I love I love Gwen as a character. I love uh, I Ella love Purnell. Him. Ella Purnell is de- delivering a fantastic performance along with everyone else. But how they painted, how the artists painted her, mm-hmm. there's just so many shots of her that she's just so beautiful to look at. You know, you have to she's also such say a- Hollow Janeway. Like, how fun is it to write Hollow Janeway? Oh, yeah, but you can't pick one. Anyways. Uh, they all, they all have them. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. I know that's an unfair question. How about you? Norman? Which one's your favorite? Yeah. Character? What's, yeah. Um, you know, at first I thought my favorite character was Dal because, you know, I, I could see myself as a young boy looking up to that character and like, you know what? I make his mistakes. I'm distrusting of, you know, the adulthood out there, the admiralty or the bad morals that are out there that are the adults and principals and bosses and things like that. But the more and more that I dig into the character, the more and more, um, that I think that Rock Talk is my favorite Mm -hmm. because I'm surprised with just her at every turn, like the, the wantingness, you know, or the, the desire just to be accepted, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and um, you know, the, the, the longing of family um, but also the subversion of you have the thing with this little bitty, like seven or eight year girl, eight year old girl's voice inside of her. And you know that she could destroy the ship with a, you know, with a flick, you know, but at the same time, though, that's not what she wants. She wants a family. You know, she wants to belong. I think I think the rock character was is great on the page. But what Riley brought to it, what you know, it really it's the heart and soul of like of what the show is meant to be, you know, like an eight year old getting into Starfleet. What is that? You know, it's a diff- that's a difficult task. You know, it's it's. Brock's got a long road ahead of her. Uh, well, not- yeah. Yeah. There's some great episodes with her coming up. And I think, you know, our goal is to, you know, grow up with, with rock talk, right. Grow up with Riley. I mean, Riley's, her voice is going to change and she's going to be growing up into a young woman. And so we want rock talk to be along with that. She's the perfect Riley's example. She's like, few. you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but she's the perfect example of of a child of a child and and in growing up, and that's what this show is about. And following all of the characters, continue to grow up. You know? I mean, as far as I can tell, um, Riley's the only one that has parody with the actual, almost kind of like uh, the the physical and representation of her character. I mean, you know, I, I thought I, originally I thought Ella was Scarlett Johansson, but you know, just under a different like a pseudonym because she has that mm. same kind of gravelly, raspy approach to her voice, which is is fantastic, but also very alluring at the same time. You know, for the older, younger, older audiences, you know, out mm. there. Um, mm. In the first five, I'm not going to ask you, I can't ask you about the, the, the up, up, upcoming episodes, but in the first five, what has been your favorite episode so far? Oh, we always do five. I mean, I think five, the moment when Gwen chooses or when uh, Gwen makes her decision. Five being terra firma. Yes, terra yeah. firma. Yeah, yeah, for me, it's a tie. Like, because yes, five is when she, she's throwing her lot in with them, right? And I always loved the ending with the with the diviner and the twist ending that you think he's found the ship and it's not. 
and the and the betrayal of his daughter, you know, of betraying his daughter. There's, so there's that. And I have to honestly, like, I still go back and I love when the pilot where Dow and Rock find yeah, the protostar. Fine. It is mm-hmm. so magical. And coming out of it, the waterfall too. I'm just like, ugh. Coming out of the waterfall. Yeah, like, don't show just, that in any marketing. The escape out of Tars Lamora, I thought Ben and Nami and all the team did such a bang up job with that stuff. It was so exciting and thrilling and so moving for me, you know, of, I don't know. So that's, those are like my favorite moments, let's just say. I don't know if I have a favorite episode, but those are the two, my two favorite moments. Now, certainly for me, I think my, my favorite so far has been Terra Firma because in five episodes or they're not even half an hour episodes. So within 22 minutes, I know people yeah. say like, how do you get that in 30 minutes? I'm like, it's not 30, <laughs> yeah. 22 minutes, 22 minutes. 20, so if, yeah. if you add that all up, it's just like a little over two hours and you could make that five parter into it. If you cut it all correctly into a two hour episode, but the, the pinnacle of that moment, the, you know, the probably the most emotional point for me, I actually cried, uh, was when the protostar was revealed. Now we've seen it before in the credits, you know, with Michael Giacchino and, you know, Mm -hmm. the swelling of the music when it, you know, transforms, but understanding that everything came together at that moment with the music rising at that moment. And then it converts into the protostar engine type. I've never really experienced anything like that in Star Trek in a long time. So, Mm -hmm. um, did you have, uh, when you screened that, what was the reaction to that moment? <laughs> I, I would say in the writer's room, there was a big discussion. I remember I put up a big fit because it was like, there was, the ending was originally Dow saving Gwen, but I'm like, we gotta, we, we gotta get this moment where Gwen makes a choice and we reveal the proto drive for the first time. And they're like, there's just not enough time. I'm like, we gotta boil everything down. We gotta get this. Cause it feels like a fifth act. It feels like, it feels like an extra act. It feels like the episode ends Dow comes back and gets Gwen, fantastic. But then you're like, no, there's an extra chunk to it. And I always love that because it keeps you, you don't, you're not expecting that extra bit. Um, but and we always knew like that, you know, what's funny, it's like you, you, you see it in the opening in the main title credits, you see the proto drive opening up and taking off. So it's all there under everyone's nose. But to see that moment, I think, yeah, it is a triumphant moment. It's a moment that I think that's the reason why I love that episode is, um, I, I'm so happy to hear that you teared up too, because I mean, that's our goal to make you laugh, to thrill you and to move you. And I have to say there are countless moments and episodes in this series that make me cry. Mm-hmm. Just today, there is a moment in a script, just reading a script that the, that the writer's room delivered and it was totally moving, you know, and I'm seeing early animation or animatics where I'm hearing that music from Nami get delivered. I'm just like, and it brings a tear to my eyes. So there's, I, I'm so happy to hear that you're moved because just, just you wait. <laughs> well, I think I'm kidding that, myself too. I just want to, but before I say the Benson sure, sure. sisters, the Benson sisters, yes. uh, Tara Firma, yeah. and I, I think they did such a fantastic job. What I love about the Benson sisters is that not only are they massive Star Trek fans, but they're all like every day, like character, character, character. Who are these characters? Mm-hmm. Character, character, character. And I don't think there was, I mean, usually when we would look at writers and we would match people up for what episodes, you know, we had them pegged early. We knew episode five was going to be one of our favorites and we picked the Bensons to handle that. So my hat's off to them. Well, I'm glad that you made, um, you know, uh, an emphasis on characters because I think that if for anything, I've learned more and retained more about the characters, the main characters in Star Trek Prodigy, actually all the characters, I mean, even Dreadnought, you know, all of them in five episodes. And I I don't remember the last time I've actually felt as invested with every single character in the span of 22 minutes over five episodes. Is that something that, that, that animation allows you to be able to, to focus on and condense because uh, that's, you know, most of, of the, of the narrative force is being driven into the characters and you can balance that maybe a little bit better than a live action series. I don't know. I mean, you could look at the original animated series and and it wasn't as emotional, right? I mean, I think it was a creative decision by us and by our team to, to really make it emotional. I think economical, like we, we pack in so much, Mm-hmm. If anything, it's like we're, we're used to actually packing in more. We actually try to take stuff out, you know. Yeah. Like from I, I, our days I, I, in Ninjago, from Troll Hunters, we're always doing everything. We're always 
taking 22 minutes and treating it like these are the last 22 minutes we'll ever get to write entertainment. And we're always like, make it as great as it can be. You know, Mike like, McMahon says something almost with the exact same emphasis. He's like, if this is the last thing I've ever written or will ever write, yeah. this is the thing that I want to like re- yes. be remembered by. And we're so yes. lucky. It's like, we're so lucky to be able to make a television show. Not only that, but a Star Trek television show. And so like I, yeah, I, 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 episodes, it's got to be better than the last one. It's got to be better than the last one. Yeah. I promise you, there's not a single episode that, that we've done that we've like, mm, okay, let's let that one go. It was kind of, you know, this is a half-baked one. No, everyone, we've given everything that we can. And I, I swear, there's not a weak link in the chain. I think if anyone's really, been in our writer's room, people know, like, we're very, very tough. We're, we're, there's, we, we come from a place of joy, but we're always like, first draft is a first draft. It usually goes to about at least 10 drafts. It's, it's, it, it only gets better. Right. Never marry yourself mm-hmm. to anything, right? You know, never, yeah. never. Yeah. Yeah. So hard that sometimes you, you got to take stuff. You know, sometimes, you usually know it in your gut if something's not working. You're like, something's not working here. I love this bit, but it's not working with the thing. We've got to take it out. So look at it. Yeah. That, you know? But I'd say like, it's a creative direction that we chose characters and emotion, you know, and that's why you're feeling it. But also because we are serialized, you know, we, whether it was TNG or original series or the older uh, series, they weren't as serialized, right? So, you you know, they had to kind of get back to a certain starting place. And so where we don't, we're just constantly pushing forward. Well, I also think that like, if you look at the standard Star Trek fan, I'm like, I could cut 15 minutes out of each of those things easily. And there's a lot of times they're just walking and, you know, a talking, and you're like, you could cut that. What's, how is this pushing the story forward? You know, <laughs> you're true. like, let's just get to, let's just get to it, you know? So that's what yeah. we're going to do. Uh, yeah. It's weird. I don't know. I mean, maybe that does come from the animation format. Like if, you know, we, we love Pixar storytelling. You look at a Pixar movie, a lot of times they're 90 minutes and there's no fat, Mm-mm. right? You watch those movies. They're so lean and mean and so, you know, and, and it's I, part of that probably Dan is, the animation, like you, you don't want to start animating stuff that you're going to cut. You know, you're not shooting extra like live action. You can right. shoot extra stuff. This is like, it's going to cost a lot of money to show these three seconds or to mm-hmm. do this one shot that we're adding. Right. And it better count. So with, with all of the uh, say um, permutations that you've done with the scripts and character dynamics and animatics and uh, development and all the, the bits and bobs that everyone wants to see eventually, because I need to ask this because you would probably ask this too if, uh, if you wanted one yourself, is there you know um, a, a fully loaded Blu-ray for Star Trek Prodigy in 4K somewhere in the works sometime later on in 2022? That would be beautiful. Um... I do know there's some art books. I know we've been talking about some art books. There's a blue, they're talking about Blu-ray. Okay. Because they're looking at, um, in Kevin's background, looking at, you can't, you can't mistake the specific PMS color <laughs> of that purple. I look, that's why I have this background because there's something about purple. I posted this on, mm-hmm. on uh, the Prodigy Twitter feed for Mission Log. I said, there's something about a color palette of purples and royal blues that it, it just evokes optimism. It evokes wonder. It evokes inspiration. It evokes positivity. And I think that being able to see that process and, and the choices that your art team makes, your art team is phenomenal. Just yeah, absolutely right? yeah. It's phenomenal. Stunning. Yeah. They're, yeah. It's they're, stunning. They're killing it every day. They're killing themselves and killing it every day. They're, <laughs> yeah. you know, Ben and his team. Um, yeah. And they've done something truly unique. And I think it's like, that's something that's special too, is to the way you, what these characters look like, the, the, the color palette. Um, it feels, it feels fresh. It feels like it's, it's, you know, yeah, I'm really proud of, of the animation style that they, that, that with Ben's direction, they went into some fresh territory. They aren't just this, this isn't just the Pixar, you know, track where it's cut from the same style of the Pixar film or anything else, you know, it really has its own look, which is fantastic. Well, gentlemen, um, yeah. I just wanted to thank you both uh, immensely for your time on behalf of myself and Roddenberry Podcasts and Ashley V. Robinson, who's my co-host who couldn't be with us. Hello, uh, Ashley. Hi, Ashley. She's a, she, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're both super huge fans. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that you'll be able to have a chance to talk with you uh, in the next eight, five episodes uh, when we can discuss what happens next. Uh, one thing, uh, if there's anything that you would like to leave for our listeners, one last 
hook on the line, if you will, for the next five episodes or for the next 15, uh, how would you like to motivate them watching the show uh, as we head into January 6th? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I know it's like it's but always it's tough because about... it's, it's like you have your brother and I'm like what, what, is, what is Kevin thinking what am I thinking like how do you well think? yeah well I'm always thinking about what what uh, what size of morsel can we give you know where it's a where it's a nice little breadcrumb it's a, it's enticing but it's not giving away the goods because when there's is this some... gonna air when is this gonna air Norman <laughs> January sixth. That's a Thursday. So there's some, there, so, there's some, so there's some ads that are going that'll oh, be okay. going right, right now. Okay. And the fact that oh yeah, you're gonna you're hear, gonna see you're gonna see you're gonna see Klingons. Okay. Of, uh, of him. Okay. But so again, not, the, nothing so that you revealed examples. is gonna get us into trouble. <laughs> no, but these are examples of you know you were bringing up earlier, like oh it's all in the Delta Quadrant and it's all gonna be just so far away from everything we know and love about Star Trek, like. Nope. No, it's not. You're going to be seeing a lot of great stuff coming up. Absolutely perfect. Uh, Dan, Kevin, thank you so much for being here on Mission Log Prodigy. It's been a great honor of mine, and I'm, I'm such a huge fan of yours and what you've done with Star Trek Prodigy. Um, you could probably tell with almost every podcast that we do that either I'm on the verge of laughter or excitement or tears because of what the show has done <laughs> uh, to me. And and I, I, I look forward to it. I, I want to be uh, either weeping with joy or weeping with sorrow or both or everything in between every single episode that we get a chance to watch and cover uh, for Roddenberry Entertainment. So on, on behalf of my co-host, Ashley B. Robinson, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening, audience. And uh, make sure you subscribe to all of our shows on the Roddenberry Podcast network here on youtube and then make sure you follow to the audio version of this on your podcast catcher of choice or on podcasts at roddenberry.com thank you very much for enjoying this and we look forward to seeing all of the next uh, few episodes of prodigy for the next five episodes uh, coming january 6 2022 this is a roddenberry podcast for more great podcasts visit podcast.roddenberry.com